Regarding the title, the two have now met 22 times competitively, with Pep winning 11, Mourinho winning 5, and drawing 6. What's up? I'm Adrian, and welcome to another Rabona TV weekend recap where we go through the top four leagues because France is out, man. And we rotate in another league from around Europe each weekend now. Sound good? Let's do it. And hey, a thank you to OneFootball for making the weekend recap possible in the first place. Even if you're away all weekend, like I was, you can keep up to date on everything football thanks to their custom news feed, live match tickers, breaking news alerts, and much, much more. If you're interested, then check out the link in the description for a free download on either Android or iOS. We'll start in England this time, as Saturday was a bit of a sleeper as far as marquee matchups go. However, there was still some entertainment in Newcastle getting their second consecutive win thanks to a brace from Rondon. They're now out of the bottom five. Southampton versus Watford provided two bits of controversy when a clear as day penalty for Watford wasn't given. Then Charlie Austin had a perfectly legal goal taken back to make it 2 0. Of course, after that happens, you know Watford went and scored one at the opposite end to make it 1 1. And that's how it ended, and Charlie Austin was on one for the post-match interview. Tottenham also played, and despite getting worked by Crystal Palace, at times, Palace looked the more dangerous team, to be honest. Spurs came out on top, and hey, that's all that matters at the end of the day, especially for a team like Spurs that's going through a bit of a weird moment. Their best start in their history of their club, or in Premier League history, and we're still looking at them like they're failing. <laughs> Arsenal faced a tough match at home against the Wolves side that was looking to bounce back after three consecutive losses, and that match ended 1-1 as well. Unfortunately, I didn't have a chance to take that one in because it was on at the same time as the Manchester Derby. But hey, looks like I missed some late drama as Mkhitaryan equalized in the 86th minute. Also, Chelsea hosted an Everton side that is beginning to pick up a head of steam across all competitions, but who would be the winner of the Ross Barkley Derby. Neither team, because Everton didn't provide a ton going forward, and Chelsea were a bit unlucky at times and wasteful at others. Morata had a goal disallowed late on as he was stepping early. Also, he hit the post at one point, but ultimately it went perfectly for Everton. They steal a point away to Chelsea. Liverpool looked to recover from their wobble against Red Star midweek, and they were handed one of the most ideal teams to do so against. Bottom of the table, Fulham, who have leaked more goals than any other team in the league. Well, Jordan Shakiri was solid on the day as he capped off his great run of being involved in five goals in his last six matches for Liverpool now with a great goal on the day. And of course, Mo Salah has also found a bit of form as he's been involved in eight goals in his last seven matches across all competitions for Liverpool. Still not flying high like last season, but he's, he's doing well. But the big match was obviously the Manchester Derby, but it wasn't the most thrilling of derbies actually as it went about as you would expect it to. Part of the reason for that could be that United were made to operate without Pogba, who, love him or hate him, is an upgrade in a midfield three that consisted of Matic, Ander Herrera, and Fellaini, with Fellaini often operating in the advanced position. You compare that to City's midfield of David Silva, Bernardo Silva, and Fernandinho, and I know which midfield I would take. And it was two of those three linking up for City's first goal. In the first half, I noticed that City were really looking to stack two men on Ashley Young, making his life extremely difficult. And it was that side of the pitch that Sterling whipped across to the far post. Bernardo had the presence of mind not to shoot, but to cut the ball across. David stepped around his man and finished coolly. It had to be him, as he scored in three consecutive matches at the Etihad now. But if there's one guy who loves scoring against United, it's Sergio Aguero, as he made it 2-0 right after the half with his eighth goal in Manchester derbies, taking him level with Wayne Rooney for the most goals in this fixture, only including Premier League matches. They're both on eight. Now, Lukaku and his size 14 Tims came onto the pitch, and just after 30 seconds, he won a penalty from Ederson hauling him down, which Anthony Martial slotted away coolly. For a moment, it seemed as if United were handed a lifeline and they could go on to replicate their comeback from last season, but... City weathered the storm, only a light storm, more like a sprinkle, and when Ilke Gundogan came on, they strung 44 passes together before Gundogan himself finished past a stranded David De Gea. And I mean, ultimately, that goal sort of illustrated the difference between these two sides at the moment. City have a clear game plan and the players to pull it off. There's quality in every position and Pep Guardiola's style is a perfect match for the players that he's been able to recruit. For United, what would you say their style of play is? Can you even put a finger on it? What's the philosophy here? Sit back and hope to snatch it at the end as they've done against Newcastle, Bournemouth and Juventus lately? I mean, you could maybe call them a counter-attacking team that likes to draw their opponent in and 
But when they do that, when they do attack, they still seem outnumbered somehow and the quality just isn't there. So anyway, with City winning 3-1, that means that for the first time in Premier League history, there are three undefeated teams after 12 matches, according to Opta. City, of course, retained their two-point lead over Liverpool as Chelsea dropped to a further four points behind City, two behind Liverpool. I hope that we have a three-horse race at the end of the season, man. It would be so refreshing to have more than just two teams competing for the title in May. Hell, even having more than one team. All right, let's talk. Portuguese Primera Liga instead of Liga this week because guess what? PSG now have a 13 point lead over Lille after they stopped AS Monaco 4 0. Monaco is trash. PSG is grossly superior compared to every team in the league. Hell, combine every team in the league together and PSG would probably still be superior. 13 matches, 13 wins, 45 goals for, 7 against, 13 point lead. Good night, Ligue 1. So, after playing to a 3 3 draw with Nacional on Monday, 6 goal thriller, baby. Top four contenders Rio Ave went away to Avs and got their match started off on the wrong foot with Najak getting himself sent off in the 14th minute, leading to the subsequent penalty getting slotted away by Rodrigo Suarez. Diego Gallo added a second and first half stoppage time, which would be the death of Rio Ave at the end. Despite them getting a consolation goal in the 91st minute, they lose 2-1. That's a blow to their top four hopes, especially with, well, let me get to it. It gave Benfica the opportunity to leapfrog over them. Yes, that's <laughs> that's what season Benfica is having right now. But Benfica did in the end have a relatively comfortable victory over Tendela. That victory only took them from fifth to, well, that depended on what Sporting did. And Sporting was hosting Shabs. Sporting scored in the first half via Bas Dost. Bruno Gallo got himself sent off in the 71st, but just 10 minutes later, Nilton, Suarez, Nilton equalized for Shabs, and what a fucking goal it was. It was all too good to be true though for the bottom of the league club, however, as just five minutes later, a penalty was awarded to Sporting and Basdo slotted it. 2-1 final for Sporting. So that means that Benfica was in fourth, Sporting up into third. And the big matchup for the rights to first place was Porto versus Braga. And the host Porto came into this one having won every single match since their loss to Benfica in Un Clasico back at the beginning of October. Six consecutive wins. Braga, however, were yet to lose a single match this season, so the table was set for a great match. A great match that Porto deservedly won 1-0, by the way, as their form under Sergio Conceição is starting to look scary this season. So, that means that Porto overtake Braga, handing them their first defeat of the season in the process. It's tight in Portugal, though, as there's only four points... Sorry for smacking the mic there. There's only four points separating first and fourth. That's what we like to see, competitive football. Okay, in Germany, the top four sides all got victories. Eintracht Frankfurt put Schalke's resurgence to a stop with an emphatic 3-0 victory over Tedesco's side. Luka Jovic improved his strike rate to 9 in 11 Bundesliga matches, while his team in general has scored 20 in their last six. Mind you, seven of them were scored in one match. But they occupy fourth and are unbeaten in nine matches now, eight of which have been wins. RB Leipzig, remember them? Remember how last week I said they have been quietly climbing the Bundesliga table? They continued to do so this weekend as they too had an emphatic 3-0 win, though they did it over Bayer Leverkusen, who compared to last season have been looking pretty drab. They've accumulated just five points from their last six matches and now sit in 13th, which is not great. RB Leipzig, however, is in third. Great. Borussia Mönchengladbach had to travel away to Werder Bremen, a Bremen side that started the season fairly well, but lately they've been in the business of collecting L's. And against Mönchengladbach, they made it three losses in their last four matches, leaking three as Gladbach player Alessan Plea scored a hat trick, taking his tally up to eight goals on the season. Now, here we go. Der Klassiker, Borussia Dortmund hosting Bayern Munich, and this one did not disappoint. So Robert Lewandowski has come under fire for often underperforming against tough opposition, but one thing is for certain, when he comes up against his former team, he always performs. And he got Bayern ahead first in this one in the 26th minute as he bulleted a header past Berkey from a Serge Gnabry cross. After the half, Marco Royce and the rest of Dortmund really began controlling the match and creating the more dangerous of the opportunities. And that came to a head just three minutes into the second when Manuel Neuer, having a tough start to the season, 
gave away a penalty that Royce duly converted. Despite this, just three minutes later, and Bayern were at it again with a beautifully worked goal that saw, yes, you know it. Robert Lewandowski score once again against Dortmund, which was his seventh goal in the Bundesliga and his fourth in two matches. But this match was crazy, man, and Dortmund continued to have the more dangerous chances and continued to blow them, with Royce in particular blowing some easier ones, but making up for it in the 67th for his eighth goal in the Bundesliga this season. Funnily enough, it was the hardest of the three chances that he had blown moments before. And I think at this point in the season, Marco Royce has played more minutes, appeared in more matches, and scored more goals than last season already. Oh, and you want more drama? How about Axel Witzel driving forward and playing an inch-perfect ball through to Paco Alcacer, who timed his run perfectly before a quick pump fake to bring Neuer to his knees before dinking it over the German keeper. Beauty! 3-2 Dortmund. I hope you watched that match, man. Now, late on, Lewandowski finished with a beautiful heel flick but it was called off correctly at that, meaning that Dortmund bounced back from their midweek loss against Atletico with a statement win against Bayern, who continue to flounder. For their part, Dortmund are the league leaders, opening up a seven point lead on Bayern and retaining the four point lead over Gladbach. Bayern have now secured just eight points from their last seven league matches. Tick tock, Kovac. I already called Lopetegui getting the sack and you may just be my next prediction victim, my man. Speaking of Lopetegui, well, España, and all things pointed to an epic match between Barcelona and Real Betis, and hey, no scoffing man, Real Betis is a decent team that prior to this match had been on a four match winless skid. But they started the season quite brightly, okay? And they started their matchup against Lionel Messi and Barcelona brightly as well, going 2-0 up in the first half. Barca wouldn't respond until the 68th when Messi converted from the spot, but Gio Lo Celso restored the two-goal lead just three minutes later, a lifeline for Barca as they made it 3-2 through Arturo Vidal, but former Madrid legend Sergio Canales provided the death blow with a fourth for Batiste. Try as he might, Messi couldn't overcome Batiste without more help on the day, and it ended 4-3. Close one. A thriller, seven-goal thriller. They lost at the Camp Nou, the first time they've lost when Messi scored two or more goals. Real Madrid looked decent again as they went away to a struggling Celta Vigo and handed them a 4-2 loss. Another Madrid match, another Penenka-esque penalty from Sergio Ramos, and another solid performance from Karim Benzema, who scored for the second match running, been involved in four goals in his last two matches. This was also the fourth win in a row for Solari, becoming the first manager to do so for Madrid since Pellegrini won his first seven when he was in charge. And maybe this just illustrates the point even further that Real Madrid doesn't really need a major tactician as a manager, but perhaps the ideal candidate is a former player that understands them and can aptly motivate them and they can take care of the rest. I mean, who knows? Solari could be riding his luck for now and could crash and burn at any moment, but I think for now, Perez is happy and willing to see where this goes. Maybe he'll go down the road of Zinedine Zidane. Who knows? It's tight in Spain also, my friends, with Alaves, Atletico, and Sevilla all getting wins. And with Barca dropping three points, the gap has closed. Barca on 24 points, Sevilla and Atletico on 23, Madrid back in sixth on 20, and Espanyol ahead of them in fifth with 21. Madrid and Barcelona were really <laughs> far away from each other at one point. Now there's only four points. In Italia, it was an especially bad weekend for the Milan teams as Inter got smashed 4-1 by Atalanta. They won't be happy about that result, but Icardi has now scored in five consecutive Serie A matches for the first time in his career. But yeah, Inter's terrible first half in which they faced 16 shots but only conceded once was matched by an even worse second half in which they conceded three goals to Atalanta. Napoli did their part to try to keep pressure on Juve as they went away to Genoa and won 2-1. The biggest surprise here no goal for Insigne, and the game winner was an own goal. Also, on a personal note, I've noticed that Piantec has legit stopped scoring ever since I profiled him. <laughs> the curse of Rabona TV. Never again shall you score. Anyway, yeah, so Roma got a handy 4-1 victory over Sampdoria, who are now winless in four matches and just not cutting it these days. But the biggest matchup was for sure Juventus going away to AC Milan and the let's see how Higuain channels his frustration towards Juve derby. That's the official name of it, by the way, no lie. Well, I, I don't mean to take pleasure from the pain of others, and I shan't, but Higuain, it was, it, it wasn't great, man. After Mario Mandzukic put Juve ahead from a tasty cross 
from Alexandro. Higuain then failed to convert a penalty, and finally after Ronaldo doubled the lead for Juve, Higuain got himself sent off just two minutes later for squaring up with Ronaldo, then f***ing off the referee. He can't f*** off the referee, man, just don't do it. By the way, Ronaldo revealed what he allegedly said to Higuain, in which he apparently told him not to exaggerate. But to Ronaldo's credit, he also said that he hopes Higuain doesn't get a severe punishment because he says that he didn't really do anything and he doesn't deserve to be punished that badly. So, Juve has now gathered 34 points from a possible 36. For those who are a little slow with the math like I am, that's 11 wins and one draw, my friends. A record for them in the Serie A. And finally, let's talk El Superclasico. Did you watch it? I hope you did. Broaden your horizons, because I certainly did, and it was marvelous. It had the era of a derby, the chippiness, the pace, the match, it had everything, but it also had an X factor, the South American flair, both on the pitch and in the stands, as the eruption of sound when Ramon Avila put Boca ahead was insane. Just one minute later, River went ahead down the other way and equalized through Lucas Prato, but Boca grabbed the lead before the half, two to one. River did equalize, however, in the second half, and my oh my did Armani ever earn his month's salary with that massive save on Benedetto after Tevez had played him through perfectly. It ended 2-2 after the first leg, setting up an incredible finale to the Copa Libertadores as El Monumental. As I said on Twitter, isn't it nice when things actually live up to expectations? Because this match certainly did. Okay, everyone, that's it for this video. But Speaking of expectations, here's hoping that you stick around during the international break next week for the closing of the UEFA Nations League, as well as some more FIFA content and perhaps a special on the illegalities of Man City and PSG's dealings regarding financial fair play. Sound good? Good. Thanks once again for watching, guys. I appreciate you. I'm Adrian, and I'll see you in the next one.